Welcome to The Performance Show, a videocast interviewing athletes, coaches, and sports scientists from around the globe. Please welcome your host, Lachlan Puyol from Puyol Athletic Development and Performance. Welcome to episode 20 of The Performance Show. Uh, Australian former tennis player uh, Mark Woodford from Australia joins us. Mark, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you. You too. So you just came from the US Open and the Roland Garros. Um, just tell us briefly about how that was for you and sort of what your, what your role was there. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, well I, I guess my main, my main gig these days is, uh, a, a, apart from being, you know, husband and dad uh, here in the desert, but it, it, it's a, um, there are opportunities for me to be at the four Grand Slams during the year as a commentator. So, um, you know, when I retired back in uh, 2000, um, Channel 9 Australia um, had, had tapped me to work with, alongside John Newcomb, Fred Stolley, and Tony Trabert, who were really the, the prime commentators for uh, tennis back in, in, a, in Australia on Channel 9. So I had the, the, the opportunity to work with them for a number of years. And I've just continued on uh, uh, commentating. Um, you may not hear those voices nuke that often, or, or Fred, he's retired, so is Tony Trabert. But um, you know, I learned a, a lot of fantastic lessons uh, from them, and, and I've just continued on as a commentator. And um, you know, work as I said, still at the four slams. And um, you know, this year being as unique as it as it has been. I mean, it is such a crazy upside down world right now, but. Um, you know, it was a lot of a lot of kudos to the USTA um, to try and get the US Open played um, in its regular time slot. Um, they did an amazing job, uh, and uh, of, of course, they've still got to. You know, whilst the matches were going on, um, you, you know, to be able to tap into those uh, TV, the broadcast, and um, so I was working for the for the world feed. Um, for, throughout the whole two weeks of the tournament, and uh, um, I have to say, it um, it probably took me four or five days to completely embrace and comprehend, understand what the players were actually going through. Um, you know, I've, I've as a former player and and having had success at Grand Slams, and then as a commentator to be at those Grand Slams and the crowd the atmosphere is such a, an integral part of why those tournaments are the elite for. Um, and so this year to arrive in, in New York uh, and go to Flushing Meadows and not have any crowd, uh, I, I don't think the players themselves probably received enough credit for the level that they were able to play at given that there was no crowd there to um, to inspire them, to lift them. Um, it it was amazing. As so, as I said, uh, after four days, I, I finally left the te the TV compound to go down and watch one of the Australian guys um, play, um, Jordan Thompson. And uh, uh, I, as I walked back, I walked by his court and stood there. Uh, I mean, all of a sudden, I could hear. It was almost like I could hear the leaf off the tree float down and hit the ground because it was that quiet you could hear oh, wow. <laughs> something that minute um uh and and here are these guys playing great level of tennis and no no one's applauding except maybe one person which was their coach and it just it it really um uh it it shook me up the fact that these guys um uh, everyone uh, was having to to un, you know play in that that atmosphere. It was really really strange. So a lot of credit to the USTA, but a, a lot of credit to the players as well that they were able to survive, you know, all the protocols that were put in place and actually play a good good level of tennis throughout the fortnight. And you see uh, the final there between Team and Alexander Zverev play um, a match that went to seven six in the fifth set and how they can keep up that level of play that high standard for for so long without that electrifying. Atmosphere, you know, we always see New York. We say that New York is the is the city that never sleeps, and they're, right. and they're, and they're, they're playing um, in a in a match. It looks like looks like it's practice with no one there, um, it, but it, they're playing in a Grand Slam final. Yeah, and usually, usually, as you say, in New York, it's it's electric. It's like a circus there, and, and sometimes it is it is so overwhelming, and it can defeat you. 
Um, you, you know, that we all know that the US Open's the fourth slam in the rotation. The players have actually gone through a normally a five, six week summer build up. Um, they're exhausted already. Um, and, and it really tests you, the US Open. So this year was very different. I'm sure players were probably thankful that they didn't have to battle um, the, the, those uh, other conditions, the, the, the atmosphere. It was very, very different. But, um, you know, and still, I, I actually think that the players that had the opportunity to play on Arthur Ashe Stadium, the main court, probably benefited from a few extra people sitting there uh, watching because I, I don't know if you saw Lachlan that the, the corporate boxes that are usually packed to capacity they the USTA gave them out to the seeded players this year so they use them as their personal locker room so quite often they would be out with their their entourage watching the matches on uh, Arthur Ashe Stadium and then the, some of the um, the people behind the scenes when they had uh, they, they were off the clock if they had lunch break or dinner break they actually came out and watched the matches on ash stadium so there was a little bit of an atmosphere on that court but everywhere else it was it was just i i mean you could hear a pin drop that, that's incredible you don't really appreciate it um until you're actually watching it there live sort of rather on rather than watching it on on tv yeah and that would have been how do you think you and uh, you and todd would have handled that if uh, COVID was back in the, uh, when you played in the eighties and the nineties? Yeah, you know, fair question. And I, I look, I, I think, um, you know, you never lose sight of, of what the goal is. And that is actually to beat the other person, whoever it is up the other end of the court, you still want to beat them. You want to win the match and, and move on through the tournament. Um, I, I think we would have been able to uh, handle it. And, and because it is doubles, that's the beauty of it, that you've got your partner to actually converse with uh, and to, you know, if they need propping up, if they need to be, you know, prodded, pushed along, um, you can do that in doubles. It's the singles where, you know, you're the solitary person out there and you're having to, you know, that ha ha you're, you're dealing with your own inner thoughts. Um, that would have been tough, but um, yeah, look at, they, sensational uh final uh for the us open uh to see team come back from two sets to love yep. down and uh it, you know make it as dramatic as as it was but but you know the same same can be said of roland garros um and if anything you know roland garros they they went about it a little different the, the french federation uh the way that they handled their tournament um but it's still they they had the 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 um, I, I guess luxury of having a thousand fans come through the gates every day was very rare that a thousand people sat watching one match. It was only when it was raining outside um, and those matches were suspended. The only the only court that was being played on at the time was Chatrier, thanks to their new roof. Um, then maybe you got a thousand people watching, but. Um, you know they 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 deserve a lot of credit as well. But for me, if anything, R uh, Rafa winning thirteenth title, um, you know, just blew everything out, everything else out of the water as far as I'm concerned this year. That that to me was um, the the result of the the year, probably the result of the decade um you, you know just something that will never be achieved again in my lifetime I, I just can't see any player on the tour now um you, you look at the the new players um city pass um team and Zvero, they're kind of pushing through they're in their mid-20s um that I, I i think it's so hard for those players to kind of push through when you've got the big three who have been so dominant for the past 10 to 15 <laughs> 10 15 years really yeah yeah if longer <laughs> yes if, <laughs> So, yeah, the feeling that Federer has been around for like decades. Yes. Um, uh, we, he probably has at, at his age anyway now. But um, yeah, look, we're, we've been we've been so blessed. Tennis um, spoiled, um, and I know that probably a bit of chatter about what, what will men's tennis look like once they retire. Um, we still don't know. I mean, look, I think tennis is in, in this battle right now. We're talking about greatest of all time. You know, does that, does that still belong to Rod Laver? 
uh, does, does Federer have a right to claim it? And, and now Rafa, you know, equaling, you know, 20 grand stamps. I mean, for goodness sakes, um, you know, their careers are still going on. So you can't really have that greatest of all time discussion. Um, and that's why I, I tried to emphasize the 13 wins for Rafa. Yes, it's, it's equaled Federer. So I, I think that's a, an achievement in itself. But 13, I mean, look, for goodness it's sake. <laughs> it's crazy. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. And, and you and Todd won um, 12 Grand Slam titles together, six of them being at, at Wimbledon. I mean, that's, yeah. an, that's an achievement within itself. Uh, what do you feel like made you, you two both so dominant compared to many of the other doubles teams? Ooh, um, probably a few areas. It's hard, it's, it would be very difficult to say it's just one specific uh, point. Um, I, I think for us, um, actually, and I'll, I'll relate it to when, uh, when I first started playing with Todd. Um, you know, it's just coming off of playing with John McEnroe. I had a, a stint with him for about a year. Um, and when he sat me down and said, look, I'm, I'm not going to play doubles uh, as often as maybe you would like to play. Uh, he's at, was at a very different stage of his career. So he, he said, I, I just, I think you need to keep playing doubles. Um, and, he, and he just ran through like a, a list that probably was, I don't know, maybe half a dozen points. Um, but the, the first one he said was, I think you should look to play with an Australian. I think you should look to play with a right-hander. I think you should look to play with someone younger. I think you should look to play with someone who cares about being a player. And a player in McEnroe's vocabulary and in my language as well, was that someone who played singles and doubles week in, week out. And when you had the opportunity to play mixed, go ahead and play mixed at the Grand Slams. So, you know, each time he relayed those points to me, I'm, I maybe had a pool of, let's say, eight players in my head. But each time he went down that list, my pool of choices were getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it almost really literally came down to Todd Woodbridge. Um, I, I, I'd known Todd for... Um, uh, a little while, we'd had the same management company, uh, the same agent looking after us. Uh, and I think as, I mean, I'm five years older than Todd, so you're always aware of who's coming up behind you. I was fully cognizant of, of Todd, of Jason Stoltenberg, uh, of Richard Fromberg, uh, and, and a couple of others, Jamie Morgan. Um, so um, I just happened to know at the time that he was finishing up his partnership with Jason Stoltenberg that had a very uh, uh, decorated junior career as doubles partners. Um, and Todd had a coach. At the time, I, was, uh, I didn't have a coach. Um, uh, I had a physical trainer because I was overcoming. I'd, I'd injured myself in early 1991, I'd broke, snapped my ankle ligaments. And so I was still doing uh, a lot of rehab that year. Um, but I wanted to go back and work with a tennis coach. So it kind of, when I approached Todd, I just yeah, asked him if he was interested in playing, um, you know, to, to give it a trial run. Um, I knew Ray Ruffles, his coach. Uh, Todd knew the trainer I was working with, Muddy Waters. It was just, it was just like this jigsaw that fitted yep. so well. Um, and really all the elements that, that I was after, Todd fit those. And I think as we learned shortly after we started playing together, that uh, he had discussed with Ruff, you should probably, Todd, look for someone who's a little older, who's got some experience, who's won some tournaments and some slams, which is what I've done. Um, so look, our combination those those elements made us a very strong pair and and we were competitive we had the drive um we we wanted to we wanted to be the best out there and playing with john McEnroe um for a whole year how how was that just given that we we know that with john's temperament it got the better of him uh, a lot of the time he was a very i guess individual player individual if you'd want to call it that um so how was the communication between the both of you with McEnroe? Yeah, with McEnroe. 
it was limited at the start. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I'd had the, the fortunate experience of playing him a couple of times in singles, and and happy to say that I beat him uh, in singles within a, a span of um, what, what was it, uh, four weeks. I played him at, at uh, a tournament in Toronto, the Canadian Open, uh, and I beat him there. Uh, and then two weeks later came the US Open and we were in the same section of the draw and we ended up playing and I, I beat him in five sets on uh, the, the main court of the US Open. So two weeks later was a tournament in Los Angeles and that's when I heard he, I went to sign up for, to, to, for doubles. I didn't have a partner. I was just going up to, to ask if anyone was looking and the tour manager at the time was talking to McEnroe on the phone um and and had whispered to me oh sorry i'll be with you one second McEnroe's looking for a doubles partner so i just kind of put my hand up and said hey, i'm looking too you know to mention that i'm i'm looking um and that's how that one occurred um and, and so when he came in the next day when it was confirmed uh when it was passed back to me that he had agreed to play when he walked into the locker room uh he came up to me and, and was pointing his finger and he was just along the lines. There were a few colorful words mixed in, but he said, you better hold your end up on the court. <laughs> and I was like, and I literally had just come out of the showers. I just had played a singles match. So I was showering and changing and, and I was still toweling off when he came up to me, pointing his finger, like, you know, you better, <laughs> I was like, but I, I'd never felt any more, you know, bare at the time. Um, and, and look, the first time we played, uh, you know, a, a day later, I, I mean, look, I was a young kid from Australia. I, I mean, I wasn't at, in all seriousness, I wasn't at his level. Um, uh, I don't know if I've ever reached his level, but I mean, I'd elevated him onto this platform as one of the greats. Um, what I didn't know what to say. I mean, my coach had just said, ask questions. He will appreciate that um, so that you can keep this balance. But I didn't know what to ask him. I, I just was like, uh, you know, how do we play? Um, have you ever played this? <laughs> I mean, so I just, for the first set, didn't, I hardly said one thing. And I, I was like so restricted in my, my throat. I was not playing well. We lost the first set. Um, and he just nudged me in the, in the ribs um, and said, hey, you doing okay? And, and it was like, I could barely even get like, uh, no. <laughs> and he said, breathe, just relax your shoulders. He said, you know, I, I, I know how well you can play in the singles. You've already shown me that. He said, just, you know, just chill out. He, he said, and, and hopefully things will get better in the second set. Um, and that was like a switch to me. The fact that he had attempted to reach out to me and, uh, at that time, um, well, I, I guess it maybe opened the door because that from that point on, I mean, I just, I started asking relevant questions to the match. Like, you know, what do you think we need to do? Is there something that I could do a little better? And wow, it just, it took off from there. Um, it's still, it's not to say that I was offering, you know, too much as far as tactical information because I wanted to hear from one of the greats. Um, but he actually asked at a few times questions of me, you know, where do you think I should serve this? Or, you know, do you think that you can get to that guy's backhand? So it kind of, yeah, it, it, um, it worked well. I learned so much and I, I probably would never have had, the tennis career um, that I enjoyed if I hadn't have had that opportunity playing with uh, John McEnroe. Yeah, that's, that's so um, interesting. I, I never knew that you actually played with John um, until I sort of looked everything up before, before doing this um, podcast. And we, we see so many players today who are either only play a singles or a doubles. And very rarely where you, you see someone who's highly ranked in the singles and the doubles. Um, and, you, of course, reached a high of 22. John McEnroe was number one in the world. But 
do you think it's because the game is so much more physical where they only try to sort of focus on on only on one event um I think, again, a combination of factors, um, you know, the, the sport uh, through uh, my, the early stages of my career, um, the, the finance, the flooding of finances of prize money came into the sport. Um, and so there was a big increase overall in, in the, um, the checks that were going out. Um, and I think, in a, in a sense, that created a bit of a diversion between the two, the two events. Um, I look back to that, our golden era in Australia, uh, our golden era where players, you know, it was, it was expensive to, to travel. Um, and, and so that they probably were encouraged more to play singles and doubles and mixed at the slams, um, because of the financial situation, they had to try and pick up a, a check in each of those events to cover their costs. Um, and, and through McEnroe's era, probably it's not so much about trying to make money but it was still was there part of the educational process was still intact uh, to, to be to win a, a doubles tournament at, at the australian open you could still call yourself a grand slam champion um you, you know you didn't have to define it as i won the singles at the australian open uh, or i won the mixed doubles at roland garros it was i won a grand slam and and that hurled a lot of weight uh, when when the prize money purse has increased as i said it created this separation between the singles and the doubles because it was a lot more lucrative to keep playing singles and there was uh the rewards were there um weighted more on the single side than there was in the doubles um it's almost like the cap uh, remained in place for the doubles prize money, but that never deterred me. It never deterred Todd. And, and again, I think given our great history in Australia, it was about being a player. You played each event. Um, so, um, you know, for Todd and I, I think we were probably in the last of that era though, where, uh, we played, um, singles and doubles together week in, week out. And, and that's for us was, key in our for, for uh, not just for our success but why we um uh our singles improved because we continued to play doubles yeah and the the reason why we were good at doubles is because we continued to play singles these days yeah it's just agents um promoters um they direct the players far too often to just really uh, specialize in primarily singles and gee if you haven't cut it by x x a amount of years or uh, you know you you, um, you you're maybe getting a little tired of the investment into playing singles well then just drop it and start playing doubles and that's just i i mean i i think it's a not a not a great attitude to take um but it's there it's the way the way it is now and i you, you know mike and bob Bryan. I, I i give a i was talking about this the other day uh mike and bob Bryan, they deserve their place in history they're they're, they're the winningest doubles team uh in in our sport uh that record will probably be hard pressed to be ever beaten um but they were double specialist and i think todd and i over the years we've got a little uncomfortable when we've been termed as double specialists because we weren't we, right. we played singles and doubles every week and that in itself made made it more special that we create ha, held a lot of records together um we still won as often as we did our success rate was was high mike and bob are only playing doubles and 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 i i, I just don't think the standard of doubles runs as is as deep or or as high whichever way you look at it um it's not it's not the same level i think that the the standard is not as um as what it should be um in this day and age yeah yeah and you see players like ash Barty who actually reached i think she was in the top five maybe she even got to number one in the world in doubles before um making that stellar run in the singles and we don't that's something that we don't see 
Sam Stozer, I think, as Sam well, Stozer. had more success on in, in ladies' doubles before she started to really get it together in in her singles. So yeah, it's the same same for Todd and I. Uh, we tasted success through doubles. That gave us the the belief that we could actually achieve. Uh, we both were in the top twenty. I know you said uh, uh, twenty two earlier, but both of us reached nineteen. Uh, our career high went, was nineteen in singles, and we both reached semi finals of of Grand Slam singles. So uh, that that really was hand in hand, thanks to our doubles. Yeah, yeah. And do you think um, any other players, maybe Kyrgios, who has such a big serve, he's got such good finesse and touch at the net. Do you think he could, just as an example, could could uh, play a, play some more doubles events? Yeah, I, I, Nick, Nick is an amazing talent. Uh, I, I think we all we would all agree with that. In Australia, we we obviously you know um, uh, uh, enjoy when Nick gets onto the court. I think the tennis world are very much are aware of the te- the, the rich talent that, that he possesses. Um, I, I've seen him play doubles, um, and he could be. Um, one of the best doubles players out there uh, as well, given, given the way his game has developed, the weapons that, that he has. And look, at Lachlan, to be honest with you, I think even given his, uh, his own choice of sitting out this year, given the, the COVID concerns, totally supportive of, of that decision. Um, but when he does return to tennis, I hope that he does contemplate to help his um, transition back into playing. Yeah. Playing doubles might be a way to help quicken that process up yeah. because you get to, he will get to play against players uh, and different points and use parts of his game that will be necessary for him to actually push back inside the top 20 um, uh, male players in the world. Well, when he when he got up to thirteen, his high ranking, he was coming into. I, from what I felt, he was coming to net a lot more. He was being more aggressive, and I feel like the nature of doubles would really, really help that. Yeah, to- totally, totally. For me, well, the best player, the best doubles player right now, uh, and he doesn't play that often. Uh, and I and I say it in commentary. I, I term him as probably, arguably, the best volleyer at the moment is Rafa Nadal, and <laughs> and and Rafa doesn't play conventional doubles, not, not in the same idea of uh, the way that I would play and Todd plays and, and many other great players. So he doesn't always serve in volley. In fact, he plays a bit of his tennis in doubles as well as singles on the baseline. But he just, his, his sense, awareness of um, the court is tremendous. Uh, and, and again, even with the the singles. I think he is one of the best volleyers out there because he always chooses selectively the time to go forward. And quite often he has a volley that is into the open court. So volleying is not just standing up at net and, and volleying it up over the net. It's actually the movement, the transition from the baseline coming forward, um, handling your movement, uh, the balance, um, and having to play two or three volleys. It, he's probably the best first volleyer Rafa in my opinion but he's also one of the best doubles players out there and I you know I think Federer could be one of the best doubles players I think Djokovic could be um, uh, but but certainly Nick Kyrgios he, he could be you know up there in the in the doubles rankings but I guess you know a lot of players these days they it's not a it's not a major goal for them to be you know, inside the top 10 of doubles um, when really the focus, what, that, what the tennis tours market is your singles, singles career. Yeah, and very rarely do we see Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, the big three play in doubles except for the Labor Cup, which was, of course, entertaining for um, all the tennis fans to see, but just because we, we, we just don't see it at all, really. Not not of, not often enough, and I, I, I give I give credit to uh, the, the ATP Tour for the changes that they've made in the scoring system, uh, and that was done, uh, you know, probably a decade or so ago. That that was really to help entice some of the marquee singles players, encourage them to play doubles because it, it limited their time on the court. The, the scoring system has changed. They've got the sudden death um, uh, scoring system as well as a third set tiebreaker. Um, 
all great initiatives, um, but it still hasn't drawn enough of the top players to playing week in, week out. Um, you know, as we, we said before we started the, the program that, you know, I live here uh, most of the year in the California desert, just up the road from Indian Wells. And um, it's probably the biggest tournament outside of the four Grand Slams. The doubles event that is played here is full of marquee singles yeah. players because they're looking to get a lot of match practice early in the year. They, they, they want that. They really yearn to, to get out and play doubles. This is one of the first tournaments that they play um, here in the U.S., outdoors the weather's great at that time of the year um so they really do get um all the big names playing uh and and which is great but i just wish it would happen at some of the other events let alone the grand slams i i um you, you know that's where the single scoring format is so with a best of five set it's we unfortunately are not going to see the best tennis players in the world compete in doubles at grand slams whilst the scoring format is best of five sets yeah yeah and do you mean best of five sets in the singles or in the doubles in the, in the well at wimbledon they play best of right. five uh, as well but primarily because the singles plays best of five at the four grand slams uh, again a lot of players today are being like uh, look i i know todd and i we can wave that flag and say we did it we managed it it's really not that i mean i mean probably we could count on maybe one hand how many times at grand slams playing doubles affected our performance in singles now i i had a you know a lengthy career as to, did todd so you can manage it to for, for any player to turn around and say oh it's just it's too difficult it's too tiring well, then my, my response is, then you're not fit enough. Yeah. And I actually had, uh, interesting you say that, I had Margaret Court on a podcast uh, a couple of months ago, and I asked how she did it physically, winning all three um, events, the mix, the doubles, and the, and the singles. And she said, well, we didn't really think about physicality back then. We just, we just did it. And obviously, yeah. The, yeah, and obviously the game has got more physical, yes. But it's, it's so interesting. Um, she's from a different era. You're from a different era of, of playing, and you both yep. sort of say that the same thing. And, um, that kind of really goes to show that um, is it really just it, is it a marketing issue where all, all the big money, a high percentage of prize money that the tournament offers, is just solely in the singles versus versus the, the doubles? Yeah, yeah. Look, look. Uh, I, 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 I can without trying to name names, but uh, I, I can imagine on the players' side and agents and probably um, maybe the tournament directors themselves, uh, if one of those marquee players entered doubles at a Grand Slam and hurt themselves, which forced them to pull out of the singles, yeah. all hell would break loose. Let me tell you, it shouldn't, it shouldn't at, 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 at all, but the agent would be so ticked off with the player because they'd say, well, you know, that's, there's no need to be playing doubles. You know, I can make you much more money, which in effect makes themselves more money <laughs> as their agent if they're winning the singles as opposed to, you know, winning the doubles. Um, and then the tournament are obviously concerned about they want the marquee player alive in the singles as long as possible because that brings people through the gates. Yeah, ticket sales would go up. Yeah. So uh, it... it, it uh, yeah, it's it's a ripple effect that yeah. is there in our game, but that's how it's it's kind of prospered. Um, if if we say it's prospered um, financially, that um, there's so much attention on on the singles, and unfortunately, the doubles these days, um, even though the ATP tour, so outside of the Grand Slams, have done a um, an assessment in trying to change the format. It, it still looked at uh, the doubles game as as maybe the ugly stepsister to singles. Yeah, and that's that's just so so interesting getting that perspective because they have tried to adjust the scoring system. They've got sudden death juice. They've got a super um, ten point tiebreaker, super tiebreaker, which we didn't really have that twenty or thirty years ago. That's sort of in the oh, last no. ten or fifteen years they brought it into junior events. 
Um, so, it, I, I mean, for me personally, that makes it more exciting because there's so much at stake based on a couple of points here and there, which can determine yeah. a match. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but back to, back to your career, um, if we talk about match preparation, one, one thing that's really, that really struck me is that um, I know that you played with a 12 by 14 string pattern. Is that, if I'm correct on that? Yes, yeah. Most people play with a with a um, eighteen by twenty or a seventeen by nineteen. How did how did that feel for you? Um, uh, well, look, the first year that I travelled overseas to Europe, so I, I um, uh, my parents uh, wanted me to finish my education at high school, uh, and I wasn't a, a studious. Um, I was a well attended student, but I wasn't I wasn't overly studious. Um, uh, but I, I had a, a yearning to go away over to Europe um, in my final year of high school. My parents didn't, didn't allow me to do that. Um, the, the arrangement that we uh, came to was my, my, my dad, as much as he would wanted me to um, uh, have that opportunity, he said, I, I also, there's no guarantee um, that you would succeed. So, you, you know, we'd like you to finish try to get that education. Um, and, and then once you finish high school, we will give you that opportunity. We will do everything we can to, to send you overseas. So um, off I went and I had a coach, uh, a coach and his wife, and I traveled in a, a, a group of other, another six or seven younger Australians around, they varied in age from 18, 17, 18. There were a couple of 21 year olds um, from around Australia that weren't, they, they weren't recognized as the best in their age group, but they were probably in the top dozen players in the rankings. Um, and, and that was me. I went away, I, I had a sponsorship with Spalding Rackets. I'd never played on clay courts in Europe. I'd never been outside of Australia, right? So I went over and I'm playing on clay for the first time. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. It was such a strange surface, this, the loose, like in Melbourne, they have the onto car, uh, ant bed, um, like in New South Wales. I'd never played on anything like that before. Um, and of course, I was, it, it built up a lot of frustration. Within probably two months, I think I'd, I, I had gone away with four brand new rackets from Spalding. I, I had a sponsorship deal. Uh, within two months, unfortunately, I'm not proud to say, uh, but as a 17 year old, I was very frustrated. I, I'd broken those four rackets. I'd cracked them from bouncing them on the clay of getting, basically my butt was getting kicked on the clay courts. Um, so our coach who was looking after this group, he had a, um, a, an arrangement with a company called Schnauert. Uh, it's, a, it's a company based in Belgium. They are um, specified in handmade rackets at the time. And my coach, Barry Phillips Moore, was the man behind the double strung rackets, uh, which was eventually banned in the sport in the 70s. Okay. Because the double strung racket, it was almost, uh, you, you've got a, a, the strings in a frame and the double strung was that he created another set of strings on this side and then another set of strings on that side. So it was almost like three sets of string and they moved. And when the ball came in, the strings would grab the ball and send it out with excessive top spin. Um, and that's why it was banned in the sport. But he kept developing very crude versions of, uh, of that string pattern. So uh, as you pointed out, a 12 by 14 racket. So after I'd broken my Spalding racket, um, I didn't have anything to play with. And Barry just, you know, a lot of the other guys in the team were using that frame. He just put it in my hand. And it opened up my eyes because I was a, a very flat uh, trajectory player. I had a, a flattish forehand, um, a single-handed backhand with slice and a two-handed backhand with not much topspin. And on clay, it's all about rotation on the ball and perseverance and tolerance and hitting high clearance, loopy balls. So I learned with the racket, how to execute those types of shots. And 
the racket that that string pattern never left never left my hand throughout uh, the 18 years that I was a professional player. Can you imagine Raphael and all playing with one of those. <laughs> um, at, look at, at at times. Uh, obviously, when when my I was moving on up the rankings, and uh, there were a couple of as I said, a couple of guys. So all the guys in our team were using the racket. There was one other one other player in our group who started to have some success, um, and and he had to play uh, Andres Gomez one year in. Um, uh, was on a clay court. Well, Andres Gomez, I mean, there's a formidable clay court player. Um, and this guy who, who was my doubles partner at the time, he beat Go Go. He out top spin Andre Gomez from the baseline. Well, it reverberated into the locker room that how could this guy, Carl Limberger, beat Andres Gomez? It's that racket that they use. It's so much top spin. The next round, he had to play Mats Willander. Yeah, so it's not it's not going any lower. It's getting you know a bit, uh, Mats Willander hits with a lot of topspin as well, and Carl almost beat Mats Willander. He, I think he lost seven five in the third, um, and and Mats Willander came off the court, went to the practice court, and borrowed one of the rackets to hit with because he wanted to see what the amount of topspin he could create, and that's how it kind of happened. Whenever I would pick up some big wins. Players would like, geez, that racket. It seems so weird. Um, and inevitably, they would have a hit with it. But they could see the, the, the um, reward with the top spin. But because you had to use thick strings, it was a very different sound when the ball made contact with the string. And that's what uh, I, I guess some players didn't appreciate. Um, they, they just... You know, hearing tennis players are visual people, athletes, but they're also very uh, much into um, the sound. And because it didn't, the ball didn't sound great on the strings. A lot of players were like, huh, "I don't want to use that racket." But yeah. hey, I did, and uh, I benefited from it. So yeah, it was a just a just a little extra spin I could um, impart on the ball, and extra spin translates into more control. Right, right, and. Um, I know you've been doing a lot of commentating um, well, since you've been re been retired. What other sort of things have you been doing to be involved in the game? Do you hit much? Um, are you playing much on the Champions Tour? Are you working with any players? Uh, look, I, I when I retired, I, I, I really would just wanted to step away from, from the, the sport. Um, I, I mean, I had just got married. Um, my wife and I were expecting uh, our first child in the in the last year that I was playing. So um, it, it wasn't it was a pleasant distraction um, for me, um, but I, I I just couldn't wait to retire. Um, it's not that I'd lost my my mojo. I mean I could have kept playing. Um, I, I just. Yeah, I just wanted to move on with my life. I wanted to go to the next stage. I wanted to, I wanted to enjoy being married and and being a father. Um, so I took probably about two years off um, where where I didn't really travel a whole lot. Um, we we shortly after our second baby came around, um, but commentary was the link um, that I guess kept kept my finger involved, my hands involved in tennis. Um, so yeah, I, I commentated for um, a number of years. I still do. Um, I have coached. I uh, I know that when Todd was working for Tennis Australia um, uh, as the player development um, uh, director, uh, he had had asked me to come in and work with a couple of players. So I've done coaching um, periodically. I haven't done a lot of coaching. Um, and that's probably based on that I, I don't like the turnover. Um, it's I, I look back and I take pride in uh, the coaches I worked with. My first coach, Barry Phillips Moore, I had I worked with him for eight years. Um, I then had a, a year off when I hurt myself and, and worked with a physical trainer before picking up Ray Ruffles. And I I worked with him. Todd and I, I uh, Todd worked with him for a long time, but I worked with Ruff for another eight years um so 
I liked that longevity. I liked the relationship and the trust that I had in my coach. And I guess I really expected that that would happen post-career, that if I got into coaching, that I, I really cher wanted, aspired to work with a player, that I could have a long-term long uh, relationship with, that, that they, you know, we built their game up and, and uh, nothing happens overnight. That really hasn't happened. Um, I, I think the longest, longest I've player, longest time I've spent with one player was Marinko Matosevic, and I, I probably worked with him for about two and a half years. Um, uh, and that was my decision to, to move on um, from, from that. But yeah, I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not really fond of the players today. They're very, very different. Um, they, it's almost like they sap the information from you and it's just one part of their game and then they they're ready to move on because the internet provides what they think so many opportunities for them to learn about how to hit a ball um uh and they go seeking for you know other information so i i'm a little disenchanted with the coaching side but uh apart from that i'm involved with the itf um who, who look after davis cup and the olympics so uh, I'm on the board with them and, and work very closely with those two events. Yeah, yeah. And interesting that you say that um, players just want sort of information. But it's not just really about information. It's about the mentorship, the relationship that you have. It's so, so key in, 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 um, in, in performance. Yeah, it, it, it is. It, it is um, to, to, well, I, again, I, I, I'm... I think primarily I'm basing that on my own personal experience, but I've witnessed that in other generations before me. It, it just, the turnover, well, may, maybe it might, it could be, and I mean, someone out there might say, well, there might not have been as many coaches around today. They, you didn't have the social media, the internet um, to, to explore and watch videos about, you know, training methods. And, and, I, and I, I, I agree with that, but, it is about that relationship. Um, I think there's very few players that are champions that are yeah. out there yeah. that have achieved on their own. Um, yeah. They have a support system there. And I, I, I would hedge my bets that they, they have um, spent time with a coach for longer periods. They don't, they don't work with them for three months and then move on to someone else and spend another three months with someone else it's there's, there's not that collective uh coaching it's more of the individual one-on-one -on -one relationship yeah mark thank you so much for your time uh, we've pretty much um reached the end of the of the podcast so i thank you again and um hopefully uh hopefully one day if uh, we're both in melbourne hopefully for the uh, australian open I'd love to uh meet you in person <laughs> Well, I'm hoping to get back to Melbourne for, yeah. for AO21. So um, maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll cross paths down there. Uh, fingers crossed for the, um, and hopefully, hopefully we don't get another spike in, in Melbourne. And um, it would be great if we could get the Australian Open going in Melbourne. I, I, I think Tennis Australia will uh, make every effort to, uh, to get the event up and going. And, and heck, it is our greatest sporting event that we have in Australia. I agree 100%. No bias, but 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I like that.